All right, thanks for having me back. It's been a little while since I've been to QuizJS, but I'm very glad to be back here. Um, if you haven't met me already, my name's John. Um, those are my socials links. Oh, and I'm starting at the wrong end of my presentation. There we go. There they are again. Um, I'm a software engineer at A Cloud Guru, and I'm also a contributor to the serverless framework. I write and blog about serverless stuff all the time. I'm extremely interested in it, if you didn't get that from my last presentation. Um, a Cloud Guru is a training platform for people that want to learn about AWS um, and other cloud providers very soon. So we've got all sorts of courses from things like getting certified to stuff like learning about Alexa, or maybe you really need to deep dive into DynamoDB. Lots of interesting things there. Um, as I said, I contribute to the serverless framework. Um, I haven't contributed much code lately, but I've been writing lots of blog posts, and I'm gonna show you some of the stuff that um, I've done with it, and hopefully, if you haven't used it before, give you an idea of how it works. Um, and yeah, so the agenda for tonight, um, I'm going to talk about what is Alexa um, soon. Now, I'm going to talk about the Alexa reInvent competition, um, how you actually get registered and up and going as an Amazon developer, configuring an Alexa skill, creating a Lambda function for your skill, and then if we've got time, um, talk about GraphQL plus React and how you can sort of use um, uh, multiple clients to access sort of some shared business logic between say your Alexa skill and a website. Um, and finally, I'll talk about what I learned. So what is Alexa? Alexa's the thing inside these two devices here, the Amazon Echo and the Amazon Echo Dot. It's kind of like IoT meets chatbot. It's a conversational UI. Um, widget that allows you to talk to these devices and um, ask it to do things or more likely command it to do things and yeah it's it's a great it's a great piece of equipment but unfortunately it isn't available in Australia yet but it will be coming sometime soon I'm sure um, so the things you can do with it is like you can order from amazon.com so if you're in the US and you've got Amazon Prime you can sort of order your groceries and your I don't know next PlayStation game through um, Amazon.com, you can play play, you can play music through Spotify, which is pretty much all I use it for over here because we're very limited. Um, you can read books through like Audible and other ebook style um, systems, as well as do things like alarm clocks, smart homes. Um, and the interesting bit is running a custom skill. Custom skills are kind of like apps, but in a conversational kind of way. There's no uh, interface, traditional kind of interface that you have to deal with. Um, so what are the things you can make it do? Um, it's, it's really broad. I mean, it's just another interface and a way of interacting with something. So people have made things like a voice activated pitching machine where you can, when you're batting, you can ask it to like pitch the next ball at you. There's been baby monitors um, developed where you could set up a video feed of your child in its crib and then instead of um, going and checking on them, which yeah, you can ask Alexa whether they're awake or asleep. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should just go and check on them, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can control servers, which is what our project did and cause all sorts of chaos. And I even set up a BrizJS reminder. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of possibilities. If you're interested, have a read there's, um, of this blog post. Um, it's, yeah, it's a really cool platform and you can do a lot of things with it. So the reInvent contest was at reInvent in um, Las Vegas last year and we got to go there and try to make a skill for that um, competition and you know there was a lot of good entries and unfortunately we didn't win. The baby monitor won but I, I preferred our skill. They won gold echoes and quite a bit of money um, and probably well deserved too but you know I still feel a bit burnt. <laughs> And you might be thinking at this point, well, I don't have an Alexa, I don't have an Echo, I don't care. But I mean, you can do this kind of stuff. Oh no, I'm gonna have to choose between the Echo and the battery power, <laughs> sorry. Um, and that's called Echo Synthio. So you go to this website and you sign in with your um, Amazon developer account 
and that allows you to then use this web page to interact with the um, Echo instead of like a physical device. Um, it's not quite the same, but it's you know, a good way to get started. So for all the, before all the fun, interesting stuff, it's important to know how to actually like become an Amazon developer. Um, because it isn't AWS. Amazon developers and AWS are actually separate entities. Amazon developers are about things like their direct replenishment system and Alexa or anything that works with like Amazon.com. And AWS is, you know, the cloud platform that you all probably know about. So sign up, give them all your details, sign your life away, um, choose not to make money. Somehow you can, I'm not sure. And then you're in. Um, so the interesting stuff is how these skills actually work. Um, they all work through an invocation word, and that's how you differentiate different skills. So um, it's how you command um, the device to do something. And what it actually does is uh, decided through different intents that you create. An intent is kind of like an action. It's um, based on what the person says, the user, some AI behind the scenes to go and work out what you, that person wants to do and then invokes an intent or tells you what intent that person wants to run. And you build that sort of uh, conversational interface with things called utterances. They're the way that you map words that someone might say to the intent um, inside your skill. Um, and all that information is gathered together by um, the Alexa service and it invokes a Lambda function. You can use a HTTP endpoint if you like, but you should probably just use Lambda, it's a lot easier. Um, and so I just wanted to run through building a really simple skill. And so the, the skill I built was a Frizz.js reminder. It was gonna ask, I'm gonna be able to ask the Echo Dot um, when the next event is, and it's going to call the Meetup API and get some results. So for this, I'm using the serverless framework because it's a really nice way of, say, packaging up a serverless um, project. It takes care of a lot of stuff for you um, that you know you can do yourself, but basically you probably don't want to anyway. So in here, I'm specifying basically just one function, um, the app ID of my skills, so I can prevent other people from using that Lambda function as well, and then some just environment variables about this particular meetup. Oh, and importantly, I've got my Alexa skill event here. Um, I, for this skill, I chose to use the Alexa SDK. So the Alexa SDK is kind of, it's a library that takes care of a lot of the um, uh, processing of the event for you. It's actually not that hard to do yourself, but um, it's just an option you've got there. So in your Lambda function, um, you specify the SDK, your application ID, and you pass it a object of handlers, and these handlers map to your intents, and you then execute it. So this is what the intent handler looks like. So I've got my next event intent, and then I've got my function that requests a list of um, meetups from the API, processes those meetups, and says either there's no upcoming meetups or when the next one is using this special um, language called uh, SSML, which I can't remember what that stands for. Um, so let's have a look at this. So we'll have a look at the developer console first and how you actually configure this. Um, is that clear enough? Oh, so I've gone into the Alexa developer console, I've gone to my skill, and then it gives you um, your when you create a new skill, it gives you a skill ID, and then you specify your invocation name. So importantly here, um, I've got brizjs all spaced apart, because if I just wrote it as one, Alexa may or may not kind of understand that word, whereas separating it out kind of helps it. Similarly with things like EC2, like you can't just put EC2, otherwise it kind of thinks it's ec2 or something like that. It has to be separate ec2. And then in this part of the console I spe specify my interaction model. So I've got my um, intents here. I say what my the intent that I want to provide is the next event intent. 
And the next invent intent is triggered by these utterances, which um, I should probably have thought about some better language for them, but it's basically when I say, ask BrizJS when is the next event. So you're putting it with the invocation word to start with and then the end of your utterance, it's going to invoke the next event intent. So let's give that a go. It would work better on this one, but <coughs> the dot should be fine. So ask BrizJS. Oh, geez. Um, let's have a go with the, the big one. <laughs> Hang on now. Oh, is it on? Oh, yeah. I allocated a lot of free time for these issues because they don't always work the way you want them to. <laughs> the big one has no battery? No, it's got no battery. It's got to be plugged in. Um, the small one has battery. No, it also has to be plugged in. You can use a power cord or you can use a USB, which I thought would work really nicely, but they both turned off. Anyway, while they're starting up... Can you control those lights with the JavaScript? No, you can't. That, that would be kind of nice. Hello. Hello. All right, let's give this one a go. Alexa, ask BrizJS when is the next meetup? The next meetup is on March 6th, 2017, zero days from now. So it worked! Yay! <laughs> um, it, I honestly, every time I make something like this, it feels a little bit magical because there's you know, so much going on there, AI, all this sort of stuff that, it, and when it just comes together, it's great. But yeah, yeah. So, so this is what the code actually looks like and the, kind of the structure of my project. So it looks pretty much like any other kind of Node.js project that you might be used to. Um, the main things to kind of note are this serverless.yaml, which I covered before. In here I've just got some extra packaging information in there. And then I've just got my normal sort of tests, I've got my source folder with my handler in here like I showed before, um, node modules, and then you know, just all the code that needs to make this happen. Um, I've got two kind of levels of packages here because um, when it's going to package this project up, I only want it to include uh, no modules that are actual dependencies, not dev dependencies. Um, because the, the size of the project matters and the smaller I can make my um, Lambda functions, the better. So to, to deploy this and get this up into Lambda, I'm using the serverless framework and I can go uh, like this because I choose to install um, serverless locally. And then I just type deploy, I'm going to give it a stage, briz.js, and then I am going to say, no, oh, that's it. And what this is doing behind the scenes is two steps. It's packaging up all my code into a zip file, and it's also creating a CloudFormation template for me. Um, and this is the main reason why you would use um, server or the serverless framework over sort of trying to do it yourself. Because the CloudFormation that it builds is um, very repetitive, and you don't want to be writing all this stuff all the time. Um, you'd rather just be able to, um, you know, put in a few kind of like higher level sort of configurations and then sort of get all that cloud formation that it needs built out. Now, I think this is being a bit... Oh, you know what? Oh, it's on my Wi-Fi. Anyway. I'll see if I can show that for a, for a different project a bit later. Um, let's go for, let's go back to presentation. So that one was pretty simple. What if you want to make something a little bit more interesting and meaningful? Um, and this is what we built for our uh, reInvent competition. 
Um, we've got three different serverless services here. One's just to do with processing requests from the Alexa service and passing it on to kind of like our business logic in the back end. And then we've got another one that's just to do with handling GraphQL requests to power our dashboard and also passing that information to the same back end. But for starting and stopping servers, we've got a bit, we need a bit more information. We can't just say start a server and just do it one at a time, 20 times, if that's what you need to do. You need more context. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> um, you want to be able to say, start five servers or kill 10 servers or however many um, that you need. So that's where slots come in. Slots are part of an intent where you can specify different sort of data types um, and give it kind of like a variable name so that when that intent is invoked, you can use that value um, in your skill to you know, perform the logic based on that. Um, but that needs to work with utterances. So it needs to, the utterance needs to specify how, um, where that slot comes in. So in this case, you know, I want to kill five servers or I want to um, terminate five servers or maybe I want to start three servers. Um, so you specify it with that syntax we've got there, the curly brackets. And that, while that SDK that I showed you before, the Alexa SDK is great, I actually kind of don't like the programming model it's got. It feels a little bit like it was written by people that aren't actually JavaScript developers because there's a lot of like, um, in that object you're going this dot emit and so it's not really very functional which is kind of the way I like to write things. And it, it's not that hard to process those events yourself. You don't actually have to use these SDKs. Um, so this is what one of the events that comes in looks like. It's got a bit of session information, and you can use that session information to keep some context about the conversation that you're having with Alexa. And it's also got the details of that particular request, particularly the intent that was triggered, as well as the slots that um, were passed into the, the request. So from there, I've sort of built my own kind of wrap around that vent. Um, similarly, I invoke a function on particular intents. Instead of having one object with all of the functions in there, I've got um, different functions. And then I can use that count that comes through to then um, pass it to my chaos service and terminate the number of services, uh, servers that it's asked for. Once that is done, then I return a result with some text, like before, saying how many I killed. Um, and we'll, I'll show you what the responses look like in a second. So this is what a response looks like. It's got a just really basic information about what you wanted to say back. Um, the card, which I think is what appears in the um, Alexa app, because it has a companion app and um, it, it shows there as well as a reprompt um, for if um, Alexa didn't, if the skill didn't quite understand or you didn't quite understand what you needed to do, you can ask it, say, a further question within that one intent. So if I said, um, can you please start um, blah servers, I could reprompt and say, hmm, I'm not sure what blah is, can you please tell me how many servers you want killed? Um, and then, as I showed before, the, the Lambda function that handles these requests isn't actually doing any of this itself. It's delegating all that logic about how to start and stop servers to the other Lambda functions in my sort of backhand service. Um, so my chaos service in my uh, Alexa handler is simply just a way of invoking further Lambda functions with a bit of information about the event um, in there. So it's really simple. There's not much code in that Alexa service at all. And then in those backend services in my chaos service, 
Um, that's where I actually use the EC2 SDK and I call out to EC2 and I start and I stop um, different amounts of service as requested. So let's give this a go. All right. So Alexa, ask Chaos Monkey to start three servers. Shutting down S3 now. <laughs> Oh, sorry, that was probably a bit quiet. Um, Alexa, ask Chaos Monkey to start three servers. I started three servers for you. And there you go. This one also, it's a bit funny with the language. So when I use five, it often messes, messes it up. So to demonstrate, Alexa, ask Chaos Monkey to start five servers. Well, Pony, you tried to start 576 servers, but we only allow starting 20 servers at a time. That was a fun little bug that we found, um, and we didn't have that check in place, and it just started a lot of... Oh, sorry. No, it hit the, hit the limits on the SDK, and we're looking at the error and says you cannot start, like, 5,000 servers at once. So we put that in there. And it's, it's weird, because it's just the way when I say five servers, it's like with the accent it's going in. You know, it's linking them together in a way it shouldn't. Um, and then I can also kill them. So, Alexa, ask Chaos Monkey to stop three servers. Boom. You just killed three servers. The number of EC2 instances currently running is two. So that's nice. And then if I say, Alexa, ask Chaos Monkey to kill 10 servers. Boom. You just killed two servers. You have no EC2 instances running. Congratulations. You are now serverless. <laughs> so, we just added a check there so I wouldn't try to kill too many. And it's it's really nice how all these kind of things flow together. There's a lot of different networking requests that go along the way there from you know this off to um, America to invoke that Lambda function and then to those other Lambda functions. But it all kind of flows well and it doesn't, um, it doesn't perform too badly. Um, so that's all nice, but we're just kind of trusting what it's told us, that it has done all those particular things. So it would be nice if we could have a dashboard that would show us what's actually going on and how many servers are actually starting and stopping. So, and particularly for the competition as well, we wanted to kind of prove that we weren't just like returning responses without actually doing anything behind the scenes. Um, so we, we use GraphQL for that. Like, I'm a big fan of GraphQL. I've been using it more and more, and we're starting to use it at Cloud Guru, which is great. Um, and I think I've talked about GraphQL before, um, so I won't go too deep into it. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Um, but GraphQL, you specify a schema. So for our project, we specify a schema where we could um, end queries. And the schema of instances, where those instances um, sat, uh, some sort of enums about the instance and the various tags up here, just a key value kind of thing. And then we're able to, from our front end, um, just pass a query to say, count the number of instances by this particular selector or a different selector. And we're also able to list instances in a particular state. Um, and again, on our GraphQL um, Lambda handler, all this is doing is just invoking further functions on the back end. So I've just wrapped the SDK to use promises because I like them. Then I'm um, taking the arguments from my GraphQL query and then I'm calling that invoke function um, and getting a response back and returning that to the client. Um, and for the dashboard itself, I chose to use React and particularly React Apollo, which is a really nice GraphQL um, client for React. And uh, how familiar are all of you with React? Some yes, some no. Okay. So React's, uh, a common pattern in React is uh, components and container components. So your component is like your, just your view with um, the HTML that you want to render out. And your container component 
sort of wraps that and provides data into that component. So your view doesn't really have to know anything about data itself. And you're usually building this yourself with something like Fetch and then um, if you're using Redux, like Redux Thunk or one of those things to um, inject those values in. But because we're using this React Apollo library, all I have to do is specify my query, the data that I want, my um, component itself, and then I just call this GraphQL method, which is going to create my container component for me, and then just inject those values into my view component, my, just my React component. And one really nice thing it's got is the ability to poll that endpoint. Um, I think very recently, um, Apollo's and GraphQL have sort of look looked at adding a um, spec for subscriptions, so you can get more real-time updates. But at the this time, um, there wasn't that wasn't there, and also doing web sockets with serverless is kind of a bit hacky at the moment. So um, I didn't, I just use polling because it works nicely. Um, so let's have a look at how that works. Um, oh, that'd be right. Yeah. So we should. Yeah. The, this is just from what I just talk to Alexa about. It's got some of the um, instances that was that were terminated. And if I say, Alexa, ask <laughs> Alexa, ask Chaos Monkey to start three servers. Boom. You just killed one server. <laughs> you have no EC2 instances running. Congratulations. Oh, you are now down. serverless. It did start shutting down. That's I did allocate time for these demos because they always do that. <laughs> um, but now you believe me, even though it didn't do what I wanted it to do, it is reflected on the dashboard. And that's what actually happened. Um, no, you wouldn't. I mean, this is the only safe thing. If you're happy to cause some chaos, then that's about all you can do. Um, so I wanted to show what a more complicated um, project might look like because it's one thing to create a really basic serverless service and then I think you can get up and running pretty quickly but some people then wonder like how do I make something big out of this um, so I don't know why there's nothing in there um, so the, the approach we do um, is we specify multiple serverless services so I've got my Alexa service um, with the serverless.yaml in here. I've got a separate chaos dashboard. Oh, that's my dashboard, sorry. That's not a serverless service. Um, and then I've got my dashboard BFF, which is backends for frontends, not best friends forever. Um, <laughs> and I've got my chaos service itself. So we, we're discussing, we have settled on using like a mono repo for this kind of thing. Though when we were doing this at the time, it was separate. Um, so you just kind of build these separate kind of microservices that you can unit test and independently deploy. And when you're going to actually deploy this thing, depending on how your CI setup is, you can either deploy them um, sort of like on Travis, you can deploy them all at once and just hope it all works. Or if you've got some kind of nice pipeline, you can kind of separate them out and then um, deploy them in steps. So I would like to try to show what um, a deployment actually looks like if we can get that to work. So I might go back to this one and see if that works. Um, or I might have, oh yeah, I do. So what this is doing for me, as I said before, it's packaging it and then it's going to upload that um, zip file of my code to S3. This is quite a large Lambda function. We've, I've got larger, but um, it's all the node modules, which is what's taken up here. If you're doing this for real, um, you should probably, and we should probably use Webpack because Webpack 2 with tree shaking, you can get like a six megabyte Lambda function down to like kilobytes. And it, it is important for performance. Um, so something to consider. And what that's doing is, this is a different project, but it's, it's creating a cloud formation template. And this is what the cloud formation template looks like once you've um, built the project. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and a lot of it's just repetitive. You don't really need to know about it. 
Um, but it's, it's all very important. So that's why something like the serverless framework is important. There's other things that like Apex, Claudia, um, the AWS SAM, um, and a, a few others as well that do similar kind of things. Um, I would just suggest use one of them. Just don't be writing all this cloud formation yourself um, unless you're really keen. Just use one of these projects to package everything up and um, get it all deployed for you. And so yeah, that's, that's gone and um, deployed that CloudFormation to AWS. It's updated my stack and just returned some results to me. If we look in the console, uh, into CloudFormation, you can see that it's just now updated my stack and it just, yeah, normal CloudFormation deployed all those different resources that it needs. Um, so what did I learn from doing all of this? Conversational UIs, uh, in one way, they're kind of simple to get going with in terms of, you know, I didn't have to write any front-end code to make that Bridge.js um, meetup app. I just kind of put together a back-end and all that um, AI, all that other stuff was taken care of for me. But it's, it's not actually very simple if you're doing something um, a bit more complicated because context is really important. And this is something I didn't dive into, but um, imagine if I asked the Chaos Monkey system to say, um, Alexa, start three servers for me. And then I said, allowed it, someone to say, oh no, um, Alexa, stop those three servers, which is a really natural way of interacting. But then you have to understand what did I just start and track back to those, um, track that context back and know then to stop those particular items. And so, if you're building something non-trivial, you're going to have to use some kind of session storage like DynamoDB to store some state. I believe you can store some session um, information like through the service, but I haven't, I haven't had a good look at that um, yet. As I said before, writing responses for speech is different to writing for reading. Um, you have to kind of split up words and you can't like put number one, you have to write um, O-N-E in there. Um, and there's also some, uh, when you get further into it, there's that SSML language, so that if you're doing like dates, you have to specify the formats and that kind of thing. Um, rolling your own SDK for Alexa is easy. If you don't like the existing SDKs, just do your own thing. Um, I always encourage people to, uh, you know, use what's available, but if you don't like it, then get into the details of, you know, what suits your needs. And lastly, backends for frontends. Um, it was originally, I think, a concept that was used at SoundCloud when they had multiple REST APIs for their um, mobile app and their uh, web application. But I think it's going to be a really important pattern for serverless applications um, because, you know, for say for a cloud guru, we might want to create a Slack bot or some, or or even we do have an Alexa skill, but it's not hooked up to our back end it's rather static and I don't want to be repeating that logic um, in those front end lambda functions I want to be able to call something on the back end that um, has the permissions and the um, data and the logic all self-contained in that one microservice um, so if there's some resources there the uh, developer Alexa blog is quite good and we've also got quite a few of the Alexa champions blogging on our blog talking about different things such as um, like emotional context for um, conversational UIs like is someone when they're saying start five servers for me are they happy or are they angry and um, it, it makes a difference as well as if you want to look at these projects the, the Skill is on my GitHub profile, and we've got a write up of the Hackster.io project and all the codes up on GitHub. Um, and if you love all this stuff, if you're really into serverless, then we're also looking at hiring developers, a front end developer and a full stack developer. So if you're 
passionate about it or you and you know you've done something before with it or even if you haven't done something before with serverless then um, come and talk to me because I'd like to talk to you um, and that's it any questions yes what's your uh, icon pack for Visual Studio Code <laughs> icon pack oh, man. I, I don't remember I installed an extension at some point and yeah it always asks me about recommended extensions and I ignore it but I think at that time I did use one <laughs> um, I must have covered everything off <laughs> oh no here we go <laughs> so what's the best way to get hold of the hardware the hardware um, I imagine you could probably drop ship it from somewhere in the States I we, everyone that went to reInvent was given the Echo Dot and we uh, won that as part of the um, uh, oh, it's a skill contest. Um, so you have to have like a um, US account for like your phone as well to get the companion app. So there's a few like things and you can't set your time zone to Australia. Um, and it's a bit weird, which is why they're kind of useless. And my girlfriend hates it. Um, but <laughs> no, I think one day when they become a little bit more invisible inside your house, um, this kind of interaction will be really important and yeah something to think about yes can you use it with amazon poly amazon so amazon poly was billed as what is in amazon poly yes is billed as what's inside alexa so they've kind of taken that machine learning stuff out and they're trying to open that up I, poly um, is just doing the speech the text to speech component um, but they've also <coughs> got something else um, which I can't remember the name of it, um, to do Lex. I'm sure they chose that name because of Alexa. To do the AI um, of understanding the conversation. So you can use that for things like um, Slack and Facebook Messenger and um, stuff outside Alexa too. You don't actually use those when you're doing this. Like, but if you wanted to build your own hardware and do something like that, you could either use the um, Alexa voice service, which you can install on any hardware or, or your own hardware, or you could use something like Lex or Poly. Yeah. Yes? I believe Alexa supports English and German, um, but I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, I, I'm sure they will. I mean, Amazon I want to take over the world, right? They're, they're going to cover off other languages at some point. I'm, it's, it'll just be a matter of time. I think there's a lot of um, more work that has to go into the AI, even like with the Australian accents. It doesn't work as nicely as for people with US accents. So stuff like that will be important. Yeah. Yes? Is there a um, Alexa skills repository where you can browse and add stuff to your account? And add yeah. So that is at alexa.amazon.com and shamefully it's over HTTP which I was very disappointed um, but that's what this does and there's also an app if this will load and yeah in here you basically you can go to your skills um, it will it will show you your interactions with Alexa, um, but you can go to you know music and connect up Spotify as I was talking about before. Um, you can go to your skills and then search for different things in here. One of um, the guys I work with built a I can't remember what it's called, but I think it's like a bad Santa skill. And <laughs> someone else built a Harry Potter and he built a Harry Potter quiz, and there's a whole bunch of sort of novel stuff in there at the moment. Um, if, if it'll load over my 4G, yeah, here we go. It's kind of sparse in there at the moment. I, I think it's an interesting point for Alexa um, and the whole marketplace because, I mean, I wasn't part of the iPhone release and what the App Store was like in the early days, but I kind of imagine this is more of what it would be like. There was, there's a lot of, there's a few good skills in here and there's a lot of crappy things like I've made in there as well. Um, and I'm sure that as the reasons to make these skills and as the devices proliferate a lot more, the quality of the skills and the investment to make them will increase as well. 
Sorry? Yeah, are they free? Yeah, they're mainly... yeah, they're free. But you don't have to pay for them. I think what you might have to end up doing is that you'll, you'll use the skill, but you might have to say pay for the service behind the skill. I don't know if there's a way to monetize it yet. That's probably something they need to work out. Um, have you looked at other skills to like, learn how they do things? To, uh, to build them myself. So I've, I've read uh, some blog posts about that kind of thing. Our A Cloud Guru also has a, um, a course, which I haven't watched, to be honest, um, on uh, advanced skills development by one of the Alexa champions. He's the guy that made our um, Alexa skill somewhere in here. Um, and so there is content out there. Um, but yeah, it's quite, it's not too hard to get up and started and try things. I mean, everything gets sent to the Lambda function and you, you're seeing all the um, data coming in and out. It's not a sort of magic black box. It's really quite simple, just request response. So, I mean, just give it a go yourself. Yeah, use that Echo Sim tool if you don't have the device. Um, and yeah, have a play, something fun to do a weekend project or something. I think that's all the questions. Cool. You can always catch him later, everyone. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me.